So here uh, we see this, this uh, Kuiper belt uh, between see the paths of Neptune and Pluto. And you can see that uh, this is filled with all uh, these uh, asteroids. And when the comet passes through, it's going to pick up uh, mass from there. So when it, uh, it will lose the mass near the uh, passing through the sun. It will gain mass when passing through the Kuiper belt. And that makes it very difficult to predict when it, can, it will come, when is the time, exact time. But we are saying that Mr. Oak is uh, claiming a corroboration in 5561 BC, so over 7,500 years ago. But uh, scientifically, you cannot even predict when the Halley's Comet is going to come next, which is just in 40 years. So we cannot even predict the year in which come, exact year in which it's going to come. And uh, we have got uh, another quote here uh, that says exactly that, that we don't even know whether it will be 2060 or whether it will be 2061. So it's like uh, 22, in 40 years, we cannot predict when it is coming. So there's no way to predict where it was 7,500 years ago. This talk uh, is dedicated to uh, late uh, Professor B.N. Narhari Achar. And uh, I think the genesis of this talk uh, uh, lies uh, in the interaction that uh, Professor Achar had uh, with Mr. Nile Sok. Uh, we already have seen this before, uh, just for records I put there. So what we did is that uh, we did the first part of presentation, uh, we focused uh, on this phenomenon of Arundhati uh, moving ahead of persist. And uh, we went into the details of uh, how uh, this has been taken, uh, where it generated, and we saw that uh, the claim is based upon one single verse uh, in Mahabharat, but uh, uh, that verse comes among a lot many uh, verses uh, that uh, describe unnatural things, and that means uh, that uh, this position was actually, uh, Arunti was actually behind Vasist. Uh, even if uh, we go through the claim, uh, then we see that uh, uh, in that claim, the Arunti was ahead of Vasist for 5,530 years, and it still stayed uh, in that position for 1,053 years. So uh, there was, uh, and still the in the Mahabharata, uh, uh, there is no other uh, reference of Arundhati uh, walking ahead of Vasist. And uh, then we also compared the, the position of Arundhati uh, with Vasist in two software, a uh, wager 4.5 software that is used by uh, Mr. Oak and uh, also uh, by the in the Stellarium uh, software. So we compared the positions in both. There was some uh, variation between them. And uh, we found that uh, the maximum difference during this uh, whole time when the Arunti was ahead of assist uh, was only 8.6 arc uh, minutes. And uh, this uh, whole epoch uh, has been uh, generated by considering the right ascension uh, of the stars. But the right ascensions uh, give you a false idea. It's like exaggerates because it measures at the equator uh, while the stars are much further away. They are uh, close uh, to the North Pole. So it exaggerates quite a bit. And we saw that uh, like right now, uh, we have uh, Arnuti and Vasis separated by 46 uh, arc minutes uh, in the RA difference is 46 arc minutes, uh, but the actual difference is only 12 arc minutes. So you see that uh, there is a uh, much overestimate if we use the RA. And uh, if we used uh, the actual difference uh, where these stars are, uh, those are only like uh, three uh, arc minutes, and uh, that's below the visibility limit. So if anybody was watching uh, during that time, uh, they won't be able to see Arunti uh, ahead of Vasist. And also, uh, the claim is best uh, without considering the accuracy of the astronomy software. And the astronomy software do not have that kind of uh, accuracy. So this whole period of uh, ep uh, the epoch of Arunthi uh, cannot be validated uh, using any astronomy software. So what this does uh, is that uh, this takes away the main argument that the Mahabharata happened uh, only between that time period. It could not have happened, let's say, after 4500 BC. So that condition has been totally removed in the first talk. And now in this one, uh, what I will do is I will be examining the evidence uh, that has been presented for 5561 BC dating. So how uh, did this happen? So Mr. Oak has claimed that the Mahabharata war started on the 16th of October, 
5561 BC, and he has a popular book uh, on this. When did the Mahabharata war happen? So the first question is, uh, how did he figure it out? Like first he said that there is this whole period, like 11,091 BC to 4508 BC, Mahabharata uh, would necessarily have to take place during that time. But that's a long time. So how did he uh, find out the exact date, 16th of October, 5,561 uh, BC? So it turns out that uh, he had just accepted the date uh, that has been proposed uh, much earlier uh, by Dr. P. V. Uh, Vartak. And he has accepted that on, uh, in this book at page 78, that Vartak proposed 16th of October, 5561 BC as a date for Mahabharata war. So the question then is, uh, why did uh, uh, Oak accept this date uh, that was proposed uh, by uh, Dr. P. V. Vartak? So basically we have seen that he said that Mahabharata happened between 11,091 to 4,508. Uh, so he goes through all of those, uh, let, let's say it says about 130 claims are there. He goes through all of these claims and he finds that there are only four claims that fit within this time period. So he discards the rest of them. So now out of these four, uh, two of them are not very specific on the date. So he discards those. And then he is left with only two, uh, one by Mr. Uh, Lele, I think, I don't know how to pronounce Lele, uh, or Dr. Warthak. And then he says that uh, Mr. Delage uh, did not fit with the evidence, and it was only Warthak's date, the 5561 BC, uh, that uh, fit all the evidence. And he says that it proved resistant to all his falsification attempts. And that's why he accepted this date. So then the question is, what are these uh, observations that he has tested? And uh, that uh, he says that uh, all of them uh, were satisfied in 5561 BC, so this, uh, again, he has given a list of 27 astronomical observations. And these are uh, on pages 76 and 77 of the book. And then he describes these uh, on pages 79 to 118. He gives the uh, more details of how he has tested and how uh, these fit the 5561 BC dating of Mahabharat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the validity of, of these tests uh, that Mr. Oak has conducted. So what I have here is uh, all the 27 astronomical observations that uh, Mr. Oak uh, has listed. So this is uh, the list uh, for the records, and this continues. These are the 27 uh, observations that uh, Mr. Oak says that uh, he has verified. So what we have is that we have got these uh, 27 pieces of evidence uh, that have uh, been listed, but then they have been described in a random order when he gives the details of them. And again, uh, there are references, but uh, they are at the end of the book. And uh, But those references are so small that uh, it is difficult uh, to read them. You need a magnifying glass. But anyway, so it, it makes it very time consuming uh, to verify these claims. But uh, still, I have spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time to track each of these references so that uh, I could check them. So what we are going to do we cannot go through all the 27 because the time is limited and it will be uh, like quite uh, repetitive. What I've done is I've categorized it in different categories, uh, what uh, these observations are. So the first one uh, is related to the observation of comets. So now we can see here, this is the evidence number uh, 19 and it's about the uh, comet uh, that is attacking Pussy. So what it says here, uh, and you can see that uh, number 13 on the bottom, so she said that it's really, really uh, uh, terrible, uh, this uh, comet, and uh, that's uh, attacking the Pushya Nachatra. So the thing is, uh, can we really verify these uh, comets? What is really a comet? And we see that the comets are cosmic uh, snowballs of frozen gases. When they come near the sun, uh, then the comet loses mass. And there is also a Kuiper belt. When the comet passes through that, uh, it uh, gains mass. So basically, uh, the, its mass is changing, and it's very difficult uh, to predict its path. It's very difficult to predict how bright it is. And uh, this was uh, discussed in quite a bit detail uh, when I did uh, the refutation of uh, 12,209 BCE dating uh, of Ramayan in part one. So I'm just uh, taking some important slides from there. The people who are interested can go through that if for more detail. So here uh, we see this, this uh, Kuiper belt uh, between see the paths of Neptune and Pluto. And you can see that uh, this is filled with all uh, these uh, asteroids. 
And when the comet passes through, it's going to pick up a uh, mass from there. So when it, uh, it will lose the mass near the uh, passing through the sun. It will gain mass when passing through the Kuiper belt. And that makes it very difficult to predict when it, can, it will come, when is the time, exact time. But we are saying that Mr. Oak is uh, claiming a corroboration in 5561 BC, so over 7,500 years ago. But uh, scientifically, you cannot even predict when the Halley's Comet is going to come next which is just in 40 years. So we cannot even predict the year in which come, exact year in which it's going to come. And uh, we have got uh, another quote here uh, that says exactly that, that we don't even know whether it will be 2060 or whether it will be 2061. So it's like uh, 22, in 40 years, we cannot predict when it is coming. So there's no way to predict where it was 7,500 years ago. And we also have another quote here that tells you that the path of uh, comets, uh, let's say here, Halley's comet that was discussed uh, in this paper, cannot be predicted for more than 100 years. So let's see, uh, with that background, uh, let's see what, uh, where was uh, Halley's comet. And uh, it shows here the position of Halley's comet on 15th of October, uh, 5561 BC. So that's when it is a uh, Mahabharati and uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon of comet is described. And we see here uh, that this is the uh, Halley's Comet uh, in Stellarium software, and this is Kritika. So it is really near the Kritika Nakshatra in the Stellarium software. It's nowhere near the Pushya Nakshatra as written in Mahabharata. But what happens uh, if we go here? So if we go in uh, this slide, and here I have taken this uh, uh, Voyager 4.5 software that was used uh, by Mr. Oak. And here you see that once we focus on the uh, Halley's Comet on this, uh, and here we have the time and date, you see that the magnitude here is missing. So basically the comet is so far away that its magnitude cannot even be uh, described, uh, calculated in the software. So in the fifth, in, on the date when Mr. Oak is claiming uh, that the comet was in Pushyana Chatra, it is nowhere uh, to be seen. It is so, so far away. So what I have done uh, is then try to find out where the comet was. When did the comet come? So it turns out that uh, I had to go through several years, of course, year by year, of uh, when the Halley's Comet came uh, before and after uh, this 5561 BC. And we see here uh, that uh, it was 5547 BC. So the comet actually made an apparition in 5547 BC. And before the time of 5561, uh, it had uh, made an apparition in 5622 BC. But that's in the software. We don't really know when it came or not. But even in the software that he has used, it was nowhere uh, to be seen in 5561 BC. It came like long, long, 14 years later. In that year, in, even in the software, this comet is nowhere near post. We don't know. And but Mr. Oak says, I ran a simulation. So first he says, I ran a simulation, observing the view of the sky near post shift. And he says he did it for two years. And no specific comet appeared. So he accepts that nothing appeared. But then he gives a twist. And that's what he does with all the evidence. That initially, what, no matter what is the evidence, uh, he will uh, basically play with the words uh, and come up uh, with finally uh, something and say, OK, this is a corroboration. So see here, we say that uh, I found Halley's Comet in the vicinity of Pushchi. Halley's Comet stayed in the vicinity until it was ready for apparition. What ready for apparition? It did not come for another 14 years even in the software. And Mahavara text is stating that the fearsome comet this uh, apparition, while trivial, this interpretation of mine corroborates Mahabharata observation. And he just says that, okay, it was in Pushti, but it was nowhere. Nobody can say where it was. It was, or it was not visible at all. We cannot, there is no way to see. It was 14 years uh, later, even in the software, it comes. If it is not to be seen, not to be in, it, probably with the best of uh, telescopes, you could see that. And uh, so how can the comet be fearsome when not even visible? And when it comes 14 years later? So, and of course, we have seen that the whole uh, output uh, of the software about the comets uh, is completely meaningless because we cannot predict for more than 100 years. So basically, uh, this whole uh, corroboration of comet uh, is really uh, pointless. So next we come uh, to the evidence that's related to the position of the moon. And here uh, we take uh, this evidence, evidence number 26 uh, uh, in his list. And it says that two eclipses within 13 days. And here uh, it says it exactly. You see that Terahome So we have the eclipse happening uh, within 13 days. Uh, 
Uh, and then Mr. Oak says uh, that uh, there was a lunar eclipse on 30th of October, and there was a solar eclipse on 16th of October. So obviously it is not within 13 days, 16th of October and 30th of October. Uh, and he uh, puts this uh, lunar eclipse occurred around the midday. So he gives the time uh, of that, and we are going to check all that. But uh, still, uh, we have that Mahabharat clearly says that it took place within 13 days, and he has just changed it to the 14 days, and he, then he has claimed corroboration. But uh, we are going to check even that. So here what I have done uh, is uh, use the Voyager 4.5 uh, simulation. So I'm using two software. Mr. Oak has only used Voyager 4.5. So this is the software uh, that he has used. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, this is the 16th of October. So what I have done is uh, in each software, you can uh, select whatever uh, body you want, this with the sun or moon or planets. And then you can get uh, all the details about its position and uh, its attributes. Uh, so it's uh, and the date and everything is uh, given here. And you see that the sun and the moon, uh, even in the software, uh, there is no, they are not overlapping. So there is not really an eclipse. And uh, you see that uh, at the noon time, it is this, uh, these two positions, the sun and the moon, the same graph with, I've given information for both, uh, sun on this side and the moon on this side. And uh, we see that uh, they are not really, at noon, he says it happened, but at noon, they are not aligned. They are more than a degree uh, away. And that means uh, they are not overlapping. So there is no eclipse. So what I did is uh, then try to go further into the details and see uh, when exactly they are exact alignment. So basically for the exact alignment, you have to uh, have this ecliptic uh, uh, longitude being exactly equal. So I found the time and uh, it shows here. So it's a little bit later, let's say at 3.50 PM, uh, we have got uh, the longitudes but uh, for the eclipse to happen, the latitude also has to match. So basically, the what you have is that you've got uh, sun and moon had the same array. So this is the right ascension, and that's the equivalent of uh, longitude. So when we have that equal, but at that time, the declination, uh, which is uh, the equivalent of latitude, and that differs by more than two degrees. So when you have that, then uh, you cannot claim that uh, there was an eclipse. And uh, if you go for uh, the 30th of October, uh, then the sun and moon are not uh, aligned exactly for eclipse at that time, at noon. And uh, But we go a little later than 1.41 p.m. Uh, we see the sun and moon uh, are quite close and uh, eclipse is feasible. But again, it is uh, meaningless and we are going to discuss why. So what happens uh, is that uh, we are using a, a software uh, to determine all these uh, dates when these things happened. Uh, but uh, what is a software? It's uh, basically uh, solving a complex set of equations. We have got all these equations of motion. It is, uh, and then uh, you can see it's, a, it's called a many body problems because you have got so many, you have got sun, moon, all these planets, and then you have got the comets. So extremely complicated uh, set of uh, all these uh, uh, equations uh, which are being solved. So basically you have got a solution of these equations that uh, is being uh, visually presented to you uh, by this software. But what can we say uh, about the accuracy? Because you are solving some equations, but how accurate are those uh, solutions? And uh, for that, we have another software. People can look at it. It's called Project Pluto. And it talks about the accuracy of planetary and lunar positions in the guide. And it tells you uh, that obviously you are accurate in our times or go a little bit uh, from our times. So between 1800 and 2200, it tells you uh, the accuracy is quite good. And they all are using uh, the solutions that are uh, developed by NASA, so the Jet Propulsion Lab. And then it gives you the standard when it was used, the name for that when they did it, because they keep on uh, updating it. So these numbers will change. And so you've got order of milliseconds accuracy. But when you go further, uh, then you go to a range of 1,000 to 3,000, where uh, you have got a good accuracy. And then you can even go, say, minus 2,000 to 6,000. So 2000 BC to 6000. But what happens outside? And clearly 5561 is much uh, before this 2000 BC to 3500 years before. Because outside that range, the solutions start to diverge badly. And he says that, okay, they may be accurate to a degree, but there is no way of verifying that. They might be complete garbage at this time. So you can have a solution. Of course, the software will say you something, but they could be completely garbage. They will not represent the reality. And then he uh, continues about that uh, with this accuracy. And this is there is one object for which the accuracy may be uh, worse even a few millennia ago, and that is moon. And that is because the moon's motion 
is irregular. So what we people do is uh, whenever you have got all these uh, models you are sol solving, you want to check it. So we have got all, got all these uh, solutions and then we have got some historical records. And uh, people then check with those records to see whether the solutions make sense, whether they are accurate. But those records do not go beyond 2000 years. So we cannot even see any time in the BC uh, where was the position of moon. We, we don't have any way to verify that. Uh, and uh, another statement about the accuracy of software uh, from the makers of Stellarium is the position of sun uh, and the equinox in the year 7500 BC may be off by several degrees. So now the sun is the most massive uh, in our uh, whole system. If the position of sun is off by several degrees in 7500 BC, you can just imagine what will be the position of uh, other uh, planets or moon. So we have very serious uh, issues in accepting the position of the moon uh, given by any astronomy software in 5561 BC. And uh, we have got uh, further uh, quotes uh, from uh, other researchers, uh, researchers who are doing research uh, in archaeoastronomy, and these are uh, Dr. Sule and uh, Dr. Wahia, uh, who uh, work together. Uh, and we say that you cannot just use uh, the, the software, because uh, uh, if you consider all these uh, modeling that has taken place, there are so many uh, variables, so many uh, corrections are being made that needed to be made. Uh, and the software is not taking everything uh, into the account. And he says that, in fact, several researchers, including one of us, and that will be Dr. Wahia, uh, uses the discrepancy in the predicted path of the eclipse using NASA ephemeris, uh, which is the best available, and real path. So see that there's already people, researchers who are deep into this area. They know that uh, there is discrepancy between what is being shown in the software and what actually, what are the uh, records even available to us. So, and the real path is determined from written records of last 1500 years of Earth Moon intersection. So if someone says they put the data in the software and you get this date, it just reveals a limited understanding. And we know that uh, there are differences uh, between actual observations and what is uh, predicted by the software. And uh, there's a, an excellent paper by Dr. Wahia on that. And uh, this is this paper by Dr. Wahia and his colleagues. And it talks about the ancient eclipses and long-term drifts in the Earth-Moon system. And uh, for people who want to read it, here is the reference. And uh, you see that here he clearly says uh, in this paper that we have used the data of ancient eclipses. So we have really records. And uh, we are really fortunate because in our uh, history, uh, people have been recording eclipses because that's the time uh, when the kings, uh, important people, uh, did a lot of donations. In those donation records, they mentioned the time the, uh, when they, where it is and what kind of eclipse happened. So we have got these records and they have gone through these records. And what they see that we have identified periods of anomalous eclipses. So basically we have got, they have listed records of these eclipses that have really happened, but they should not have been visible according to the software. And here's a graph uh, in which uh, they saw that here is a, the year, uh, even from 1000 to 1600. So it's like uh, even within like last 1000 years, there are so many eclipses that have been recorded but uh, they should not have been visible from where they are recorded according to the NASA software. So basically we see that uh, there's no way to predict the uh, eclipses so far back. And we can also see that uh, using, when we compare different software. So you see that Mr. Oak has used uh, this uh, software, Voyager 4.5. Uh, I gave the data according to that. And now I'm going to show you the data from the Stellarium. And you'll see that uh, even in the softwares, the data do not match. And uh, in the same time, we have got this Stellarium uh, simulation. When we talk about did not have the same ecliptic uh, longitude on 16th of October of 5561 BC. So in the Voyager, we saw that at least they had the same longitude. But in the Stellarium, uh, we find that this did not uh, take place at all on 16th of October in the software. Actually, it happened on 17th of October. And I show you the exact time here. Uh, and you see that uh, uh, Stellarium, we have the sun and moon had the same longitude, ecliptic uh, longitude, on 17th of October. And that too also was, uh, it was like uh, 3 a.m. And this is not matching with the Voyager 4.5. And uh, if we go to this uh, 30th of October, again, we see that uh, the longitudes uh, are not same, which uh, will be if uh, there was an uh, eclipse because uh, this will be like on the other side. So what happens is that uh, during the solar eclipse, you'll have the same ecliptic uh, longitude uh, because uh, they are in the same uh, direction from Earth. But what happens on the lunar eclipse is that they are exactly opposite side. Uh, so they will be separated by 180 degrees. 
but that did not happen on 30th of October. It actually uh, happened on 31st of October in the Stellarium simulation. And I've given those uh, details here, the Mac. Uh, on one side, the details of Sun, and the other side is the details of Moon. And you see that there is no match with the Voyager 4.5 software. Uh, so concluding with on this part uh, is that uh, Mr. Oak has initially claimed corroboration of Mahabharat that two eclipses took place within 13 days. But he did not verify that, actually, because his dates are October 16 and 30th. So he then changes it to 14 days and claims corroboration. But even that was not seen in the software itself. And uh, if uh, the October 17th, see that uh, either 16th in the Voyager software, but 17th uh, uh, in the Stellarium software, and that also in the like 3 a.m. So at that time, you won't be able to see any solar eclipse. And of course, all of this is really a speculation because no software has accuracy to confirm an eclipse in 5561 BC. So now we come uh, to the evidence that relates to the position of the planets. And what I have done here, again, I have gone through both software and I have noted, so for each one, I selected each of these planets, so Saturn, Moon, Sun, all of them, and then I wrote down their longitude. And similarly, I did for many of the important Yogtaraj of the Nachatraj, and uh, those are listed here. So those are the uh, Nachatraj, uh, the, and uh, this is the uh, longitude of the Yogtaraj of uh, these Nachatraj. So I did it in the Stellarium. Uh, I also did it uh, in the Voyager 4.5. Now this is listed here so that we can see uh, at least uh, when we are talking about the planets or moon, uh, moon or sun, uh, then where what was their longitude, and then we can compare uh, with the Yog Taraj of the Nashatraj, and we can see where they were, because they, they are all these uh, uh, evidence talk about, okay, this planet was near this Nashatra, so that we can uh, see that. So it's listed here, and we are going to uh, go through. And since I'm using uh, two different software, then we can uh, always ask whether they are really talking about the same time or date. So you can see here, uh, here it says October 15, uh, 50, 561 BC, so that's the eve of the Mahabharata war. That's when uh, these uh, phenomena are described, most of them. And then here you see the 5560, and here it's not saying BC, but the minus, when it is a minus sign, then you have to add one uh, to that. So this, because there's a zero in the software. And so it is 5561 BC at the same time, 8 p.m. and here 8 p.m. And uh, to see that, you see that they also give you a Julian date. So see the Julian date here, 309443. Uh, for a stellarium. And here also, so you can see the Julian uh, day is given, 309443. So you see that these two match. So th these are both for the same time in the software. And uh, so we go here through uh, some of uh, this evidence. And one of this is this evidence number one, uh, which says that Jupiter and Saturn were near Visakhana Chatra. And uh, this is the words here, talks about uh, Jupiter and Saturn being uh, near Visakhana and then Oak says that he ran a simulation and uh, then he claims satisfactory corroboration. The first thing is that these are being uh, said about on the eve of the Mahabharata war. He goes back two years. He says that I checked for two years, but the position has to be on that day, not like two years. And even those two years, he tells you it is between uh, these Nashatras and uh, then Saturn between these Nashatras. And uh, so this is uh, uh, the order of the Nashatras, where uh, in which order the Nashatras Nashatras are, and uh, this is the Visaka here, where the Jupiter and Saturn are supposed to be. Uh, but here it says uh, that Saturn spent three Nashatras. So we got here, say, let's say Mool to Trasada, and you see that Visaka is here. Even if they are so far away, uh, then still uh, he claims a corroboration, which is nowhere near. I mean, what will be near Visaka? It will be either Swati or Anuradha. It cannot be all the way up to here, Uttrasada and Sravan. And here is our sky map uh, for uh, that time. And again, so here I have selected, so this is Jupiter. So this is the selected Jupiter and all the attributes are there and the date. And you see that the Sravan Nachatra is here. So on that day, in the software, it is uh, near the Sravan Nachatra. And if you, uh, Saturn is here, and you see that Saturn is quite close uh, to the Yogtara of Chitra Nachatra. So it is quite close to Chitra in this uh, software. And of course, uh, we see that uh, Saturn is nowhere close uh, to Visakha. And you see that uh, Visakha is here and uh, Saturn is uh, here and the Jupiter is even uh, much further, uh, was uh, Jupiter far, far away uh, from Visakha. So there is no corroboration, but Mr. Oak uh, claims corroboration. And this, this one, uh, 
uh, uh, he says Saturn was uh, near Uttar Falguni, and again, he claims uh, he goes through a period of more than two years, and uh, then he claims uh, there is corroboration. Uh, but already uh, we have seen that. I think uh, we have got the conflicting observations here because the uh, Saturn is uh, near Chitra, and it does not. Uh, Again, the Falguni is here, and you see that uh, this is far away. And uh, then uh, there is this uh, evidence number three of Mercury traveling through all the nakshatras. And look what he says. He says the Mercury is traveling through all the nakshatras over a period of one year is trivially true observation, and no verification is required. And then he says this observation certainly corroborates my conjecture. If it uh, satisfies everything, then what is specific about your date? How can you say, okay, this certainly corroborates my conjecture? And just for records, uh, this is uh, where in the software, the position of Mercury is. Then he talks about the evidence number four, and in which uh, is about Mars going Vakri. And uh, this is uh, the verse here. Uh, and it says that Mangal Grah Jastha Kenikat Se Vakrigati Ka Asrailer. Kar Anuradha Nishatapar Jana Chate. So the Mars is... Uh, uh, near the Jesta, and uh, uh, it is in a Vakri motion. And uh, this is uh, has been accepted as a retrograde motion. So this uh, is the accepted meaning of this Vakri motion, which is retrograde motion. And you see that it simply takes place because of the relative speed of Earth and Mars. And it's uh, illustrated here. You can go to this site if you want to read more. So basically what happens is that the planet is going like that, and suddenly it seems to change direction. And then it goes like that. So basically, this will be considered Vakri. She's crooked, curved. This is an obvious uh, explanation, and this is the standard explanation. But uh, Mr. Oak did not find it, so he coins his uh, own interpretation. He says, modern Indian astronomy astrology interprets Vakri in the sense of retrograde. And I was looking for this evidence, and he did not find it. So what he did, uh, he finds uh, another uh, explanation. And he says that, uh, description of the motions and uh, this Mars makes it ample clear that Mahabharat astronomers refer to oblique crossing of ecliptic by a planet as Vakri motion. So he just comes up with his new definition if uh, the data does not uh, meet his date. Uh, but when uh, Mr. Oak arbitrarily defines a new meaning of a very well accepted term, he cannot claim it as corroboration because uh, he's just uh, making it up. And then we go uh, to the evidence about uh, the Venus uh, being near Purv Bhadrapada. And uh, this verse says that we got the Bhishma Prabhupada 315. And Sukra Purva Bhadrapada par Arudho Prakashit Hora. So uh, the Venus is in Purva Bhadrapada. And uh, if you look at the software, then have, again I have selected Venus here. And uh, this is uh, closer to the Yogtaraj of Dhanistha and Sravan. And uh, it is nowhere close to the Purva Bhadrapada. Now uh, we have seen that, that even when he claims corroboration, even the software does not show that uh, corroboration but he claims the corroboration anyway. Then again, the software that he's using is uh, Voyager 4.5. And uh, the maker of that uh, is this uh, Karina. And uh, this is what uh, they say about their software. I can read here. I'm not going to read all of it, just to save time. And he says here, the values for periods before 500 BC are very approximate and they have uncertainties of 10% or more. So just in 500 BC, the software that he uses uh, says that the values are approximate and he applies it not only to 5561 BC, more than 5,000 years. He even applies to the his timing of Raman, that 12,000 BC. So you, you can see that how ridiculous it is. He has not uh, read even the software and uh, what is the error in the software. And uh, again, uh, all these planetary, uh, uh, even, even if there is a corroboration for these uh, planetary positions, uh, they can be dismissed uh, because they cannot be very specific. These are satisfied every few centuries. And uh, we have it uh, from this uh, paper uh, article by uh, Dr. Sule and Dr. Vaya, who work in the archaeoastronomy. Uh, and it says that the astronomical events do have a margin of error. Uh, when one says Saturn in Kanyarasi, we should realize that Saturn spends an average of 2.5 years in each zodiac sign. Uh, in that period, the Mercury and the Sun would have visited each of these Rasis. And what is said that uh, by a rough combination, a typical combination is due for repetition every few centuries. So things repeat. Even if you can claim a corroboration in that time, he did not specify the time exactly for Mahabharat because these things are satisfied every uh, couple of centuries. And uh, also uh, the people who are interested in knowing more about these corroborations uh, by uh, Mr. Oak, then I've already shown through the software, uh, Dr. Jessie Sarnathan, she has got a book 
on this, in which uh, she refutes uh, Mr. Oak's claims on this date. And she has got an appendix on that list of manipulations done by uh, Mr. Oak to corroborate the Mahabharata. So you can go, I've not gone through all of them, so most of them just to, for illustration. And you can uh, see discusses all of them, like what is wrong with uh, all these corroborations that Mr. Oak has done. And then finally, uh, I'll come uh, to the corroboration of analogies. So here is the evidence uh, 14 that Mr. Oak claims to have corroborated. And uh, see here, this is the verse 137.22. And it says, Rajan un sat maharathiyo ne kupit ho bhim sen ko usi prakar pira di, jaise sat grah prajau ke sanhar kaal mein som ko pira dete hain. You can see that it clearly says jaise, and he claims that this is an astronomical observation, which is not, it's just an analogy. And uh, he just uh, corroborates that. Observation refers to seven planets attacking the moon. And then in the seven planets, he also uh, has uh, Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus, uh, which are not uh, visible at all to a naked eye. Uh, then uh, he postulates that uh, Sage Vyas could see all of uh, these, but uh, uh, we don't have any evidence anywhere that uh, these were observed. Uh, the thing is that then he just keeps on uh, doing corroboration of analogies. So he claims all these hundreds and hundreds of uh, these corroborations. Every time you can go through his Twitter feed, he just uh, tells you, for Mahabharata, I have got 300 uh, corroborations. Uh, then he will say 600 for Ramayan. Then he will go and say, I have got uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, corroborations. But those are mostly analogies. And any thinking person will be really embarrassed to say that these analogies are astronomical observations. But Mr. Oak just keeps on corroborating these analogies one after another, after another, and he has uh, got episodes after episodes, these corroboration, corroborating the analogies. And here I give you an example of one of his talks uh, that was on the Satology channel. Uh, it was the mysteries of Mahabharata astronomy and conjunction of planets. He talks about the conjunction of planets in that he talks about the seven evidence, uh, pieces of evidence. And you can see here, his uh, claim number one that he corroborates is this. Us samay ran bhumi mein ve dono veer praspar kupitho ros mein phade ve mangal or can read this part with the images coming. So, but it, it is an uh, analogy here uh, of, what uh, is it, samre kurdho uh, angarak, uh, mangal and buddh. So the, this is all like that. And uh, uh, then again, the claim number two, another analogy, Bishma power 45.57. And again, it's an uh, analogy of this war between Sukra and mangal. And uh, the third one, Again, an analogy. They say the word, see here the mano, yatha. And this tells you that this is an, uh, an analogy, like Buddha and Sukra are fighting. But then he will go to a software and then he will say, okay, this corroborates my date. Then the claim number four in that talk, Satki or Sri Krishna dono us sesa pro bate ve Arjun ke situe chandrama ke saman jan parte the. See here? So we, it's all uh, an analogy. And he keeps on corroborating analogies. See that another analogy. Uh, and then this was his sixth corroboration out of the seven. Uh, they look like this. See that another analogy. And then uh, this was the seventh one, which looks like uh, possibly a astronomical observation. So out of the seven, he had six of them that were uh, just analogies. So to conclude then, so that we have gone through all of major evidences that he has presented. And then we have described uh, them in detail using this uh, astronomy software, Voyager and uh, Stellarium. And uh, to conclude, uh, what we have is that uh, Mr. Oak claimed that a comet attacking Pustia in 5561 BC, he identified it as Halley's Comet uh, using Voyager 4.5 simulation. But when I checked this uh, Voyager 4.5 itself, the comet made an apparition. So it was visible from Earth only in 5547 BC, that also in the simulation. But it was nowhere close to Earth in 5561 BC. Nobody could have observed it, uh, but he still claimed a corroboration. But uh, anyway, the astronomy software output is meaningless for position of comets because you cannot predict the path and brightness of comets beyond one century. Then uh, he claimed uh, the corroboration of uh, two eclipses, but he changed it to 14 days. And uh, then even uh, he claimed a solar eclipse on October 16th using the software, but the software did not show an eclipse on that day. Again, the astronomy software output is meaningless for the confirmation of eclipses uh, because you cannot uh, do that for even more than 2,000 years. Then he has claimed uh, about 
corroboration of uh, different planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury. But we saw that even in the software, they do not corroborate. Then he uh, could not corroborate the Vakri motion, uh, which is the standard uh, interpretation is retrograde and which is obvious from the picture I showed of the retrograde motion that that's what uh, will be considered Vakri. It's a crooked motion. Uh, but he cannot corroborate that, so he invents a totally new meaning of uh, a planet just crossing the ecliptic. I mean, there is nothing wakri about it. There is nothing crooked about it. It just uh, planets cr uh, will cross the ecliptic all the time without any crooked motion. And uh, so we continued. Uh, we saw that even for Venus, uh, it was uh, not matching. It was even in the software, it was near Dhanista, uh, not near Pur Bhadrapada, and he still claimed corroboration. And uh, again, there is uh, no sort of astronomy software that is, can be considered reliable at this time uh, for 5561 uh, BC. Uh, in fact, the software that Mr. Oak uses uh, says that it is not valid beyond 500 BC. Again, the corroboration of planetary positions can be dismissed because there are periodic observations. So unless there is a clinching evidence for a specific year, uh, these uh, cannot specify the year of Mahabharata. And uh, even uh, more concerning, that deeply concerning, uh, is that Mr. Oak corroborates analogies, analogies after analogies, and he uses those analogies to dismiss real observation. And uh, I will talk more about that in the final part, uh, where he dismisses the real observation, actual observation, by claiming all these analogies. And finally, there is no clinching evidence uh, for Mahabharata war, as we have discussed, to have taken place in 5561 BC. And I would like to thank my hosts, uh, Sutiji, Raviji, and also Sri Rahul Divanji for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, the Sangam Talks team. And these are uh, my contact details, my email, Twitter, blog, and Academia, uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me. Uh, Raviji, uh, sir, you as you said about like uh, these analogies, which, uh, uh, which Mr. Oak has, uh, mentioned right in his books and all so like he mentioned that okay these uh, these nakshatras were in this place or like like you said about those seven planets are uh, you know uh, like the seven planets are troubling the moon those kind of things right so does he give any particular uh, you know uh, date for those things like this happened uh, like or maybe like in last like uh, 7000 years these things happen how many times or something like that like what all seven eight uh, evidences that you said uh, from what I have seen in his videos uh, is that he checks it from uh, the date of uh, 16th of October being the first day. So like uh, those are the observations that we talked about, like uh, about uh, during the war. So it is, it is whether it is on the 10th day of war or 14th day of war or 18th day of war. So those days uh, uh, he, he will bring up uh, the sky maps and then he'll say, okay, this is corroborated.